Zanny Louise, um, we're doing things differently today. Um, I'm going to take your chair. I'm going to take your podcast chair because your beautiful book, Cora, Seen and Heard, it's mm. finally out. Yay. And I got my copy yesterday and I have to say I read it in a day. I can't believe that. I'm very <laughs> jealous of your reading speed for one thing, but yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> no, but it's all your fault. It's all you're doing because you write so beautifully. The, the, the flow of your words is so gorgeous. You you write with such an intimate honesty. And, and so I feel like you are literally whispering in my ear saying, I need to tell you this really important story. So because you have this gift for words and you make it so wonderful to read it's it's I read it in a day I'm not sure I would read all novels in a day but yours I did so can I can I start with so your very first chapter is called Cora 2.0 mm-hmm. 2.0 and your very last chapter is called Just Cora mm-hmm. um so I wondered if you can tell us about this novel and if those two kind of chapters in any way sort of hint about what they well they it. certainly do yeah and even from the title Cora seen and heard uh yeah it's certainly about Cora kind of coming to terms with being who she is all her flaws weaknesses and as I, I I often refer to her as the theatre itself, you know, flaky paint, burst pipes and all. Because um, Cora, well, she starts her story being the 12-year-old I think I was and probably wow. way beyond 12. Um, <laughs> that was one of my questions. How much of Zanny is in the uh, lovely Quite a lot, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably should go back one further step and say that I saw a picture of a ballroom. It's by uh, Francis uh, Mamet, I think, or Mamet. Uh, he's French. He's a photographer and he takes this beautiful, he travels around the world taking photographs of things that are kind of falling to pieces and abandoned. And he did a whole series on abandoned ballrooms. And there was this oh. one, oh, and this picture of these abandoned ballrooms just, made my heart explode I was like whoa you know I want to put a story there and it just so happened at the same time I was wrestling or was trying to think about what was I really preoccupied with when I was 12 um and it was similar to what my daughter was kind of going through when she was 12 so I was picking up similar kind of threads and that was the fact that when I was that age I felt like a certain person in my head and I think I've sort of become more and more that person through the years but you know who I was in my head and and the way my voice sounded and things like that was so different to how I acted in the world it was kind of like who I was in the world was like this stiff weird puppet who couldn't speak properly (laughs) and (laughs) I don't think that's you know really what other people saw but that's how it felt to me you know like I I could never really say or do those cool things I wanted to do and you know be that relaxed confident person I wanted to be and I'd look at everyone else and it looked like they had it sorted and so often my little journal entries in my diaries were things like why does everyone else have it so worked out? (laughs) I was so kind of obsessed by this. Um, And it wasn't till at some point, probably not till my 20s really, um, that I I suddenly realised, oh, actually no one really has it sorted and everyone feels a little bit broken and in disrepair. And the more honest we are about who we are and how we feel about that, we can, you know, other it allows other people to share and, and so that's kind of a realisation I came to over sort of 10 or so years. So poor Cora has to go through all of that in, you know, what, a couple of months. So <laughs> to speed so it up how, for her. Yeah. How did Cora and her family end up in this broken down, dishevelled theatre? So her dad is, uh, I mean, he when my husband Greg read this, he's like, is your dad inspired by me by any chance? <laughs> well a little part yeah they're a part certainly part um he's a very opt- her dad is a very optimistic kind of you know he 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 renovates things and and he's done this little renovation project out at you know lightning ridge he's he's bought this little weird shack and renovated it and that was just a disaster for everyone involved you know but now he's doing it again he's just bought this whole theater which is in tasmania so in the winter so it's cold 
It's got no running water. You know, it's a complete, honestly, like a dump, you know, it's abandoned. It's been abandoned for decades. And he thinks it, he, he buys it thinking, yeah, this is a great idea. I'm going to move my whole family down here interstate from Ipswich in Queensland and we're going to just live here and renovate it while we live here. So anyone who's ever done renovations is thinking that's a terrible idea. But anyway, Hank, Hank thinks it's a great idea. And we get, there's so many beautiful themes. And this is another thing you do so well. You you draw, you draw drop these little themes and they all beautifully kind of come together because they also meet somebody or there's a famous person in the town, isn't there? Um, mm. And the town is almost kind of known for this person. Yes, so the theatre really only because this is a little region, it's a made up town, it's called Caroline Creek in Tasmania um, and it's regional, it's very remote. Um, but the only reason why this town or this theatre had any significance on the map at all was because this star, jazz star from the 60s and 70s, Claire de Lune, and she, uh, you know, made her mark on this scene. She was actually from Canada but she became famous because of this theatre because she would perf she'd perform there on weekends and people became this kind of quirky thing people would do, travel from the cities and eventually travel internationally to come and see her in this little place. And then she kind of disappears off the face of the earth. Um, no one knows what happened to her. Um, there's lots of speculation, lots of theories, but she's just gone. Um, and so uh Cora's dad part of why Cora's dad's obsessed with this theater he's like but this is the birthplace of Claire de Lune this is where she made her mark and and Cora being 12 is like who's Claire de Lune <laughs> why yes. who cares um she's an old jazz star um but as she listens to her music she likes her music but she also happens to find underneath the theater is a costume vault and I don't know if you're 12, finding this secret costume vault full of all these costumes is pretty cool. Um, and she, oh, no, I'm I'm way older than 12, and I love every single time they went down <laughs> to the costume vault and got dressed up. I went, oh, I felt like saying, can I come too? It yes. was so beautiful. I love yeah. that part of it. And, and I do love her relationship with her older sister, Becca. Um, and yeah. so she and Becca share this. Becca's quite different from Cora because Becca's got mm. it good. Um, but Becca's down in the vault with her anyway. But she find, down there she finds a letter from Claire de Lune and the letter basically is written as if it's speaking to Cora about this experience of feeling like who you are inside is not the person who you are out in the world. She's like, if a person like Claire de Lune, who is this fabulously amazing entertainer, felt like this wow, you know, is she speaking to me? And so Cora starts to write to her and she writes to her as if she is alive, as if she's actually going to receive the letters. She never sends them, of course, because she has no, you know, as far as she's concerned, um, this woman's disappeared or dead or she doesn't know what's happened to her. Um, but then the letters go missing. So that becomes yeah. the whole kind of crux of the novel is that Cora's private life is not only missing but it's yeah possibly going to appear in the local newspaper <laughs> all of her deepest darkest most embarrassing secrets <laughs> and when you're well, when you're any age that's terrible but when you're 12 and she's already <laughs> struggling and I mean Cora is so gorgeous and I I do I want to give her a hug and say you'll be fine you'll be great and you know but you know that she needs to go through all of that angst and and I love that 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 you know Zanny and Cora as little 12 year olds thought why does everyone else have it together and I love those moments where you go actually they don't and and maybe that's okay that we anyway I just because I love the way to you dealt with those multiple storylines and they all threaded back to a couple of really gorgeous themes like that it was it was it tough balancing you know, mum and dad and, and no, you were fine. It's kind of weird. Yeah, I did write it in those COVID-ish times, you know, where every, the whole world was quiet. You know, it was in a period where the girl we were homeschooling with the girls and in the morning we'd do a little bit of schooling with them. I'd go for a run or a walk in nature. I'd come home and write and they'd sit beside me and read or do their work or whatever. And I just sort of wrote it in that space. And it was beautiful sort of threading all these things together. And they did actually happen a little bit serendipitously. Yeah. It wasn't until halfway through the novel where I thought, oh, this is perfect that the novel is being renovated and she is as well. <laughs> and then I love, oh, so much. Then, I love. 
And then the facade of like wearing costumes is yes. like putting on a mask. It's putting on a facade. That relates so well to her whole, anyway. So it did yeah. feel like the threads actually did tie themselves. There was, I've never attempted to write a mystery or any kind of thing like that. I was quite scared about doing it. Uh, I didn't intend to do it. I just sort of found my way doing it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so every now and then I'd get into these mental knots and yeah, my friend Kia would help talk me through it. And then um, Greg's quite logical. So he would talk me through it. Uh, um, and then in the end, it was, yeah, my editor, Chloe, she just, she was like, oh, lean into the mystery. And I was like, oh, really? Yes. Yeah. And so she helped me kind of really, yeah, be, be feel more confident about the mystery itself because I was quite scared to lean in that direction. Yeah. And I'm glad you did because it's beautiful. Thank you so much. It was a glorious, gorgeous read. It's, oh. I mean, everyone who reads it is just going to love it because you do feel like you've been invited into this lovely, knotty, flawed family that who were beautiful and kind and, you know, and, and flawed in, you know, in the measure that humans are. So thank you, Zanny. I think it is just gorgeous. And I'm, I'm, oh. I thank you for facing your fears on behalf of all the readers who are going to love it. <laughs> Thank you. thank you oh Deb thank you that means the world to me um and if people do want to read the first chapter they can go onto my website and have a look at that if you get a taste of what it's like <laughs> thanks Deb thanks Annie